Well, joining me now to discuss China's near-term prospects and especially its role within the BRICS is Gene Ma. He's the chief China economist at the Institute of International Finance. Welcome, Gene. Thank you. So with China holding the BRICS presidency this year, they also got to choose the theme and they decided to choose stronger partnership for a brighter future. What's the significance of that? You see, these five countries are, are the major developing economies. Uh, all together among these five countries, they account for 40% of the global population, which is a huge um, a number, uh, on one third of land mass, 20% uh, of the GDP. But the, however, the trade um, by these five countries is only 15% of global GDP. And uh, even worse, the trade among these five countries actually is very little, even though China um, I bought a lot of commodities from uh, Brazil and South Africa. But look at the trade between, say, China and India, still too little. And so with that being said, help us understand the imp importance then of but not only to China, but also to Xiamen of hosting the BRICS. Uh, Xiamen is a nice place to host the summit. It's a nice, uh, beautiful coastal city. Uh, and it's a very long tradition of um, uh, commerce uh, and during maritime. Um, so uh, it's a, it's a cross-border uh, of... Uh, Quite straight uh, from Taiwan, uh, so it's a, a nice location for the, uh, for the summit. So, looking at the countries involved, mm. how do you view China's economic opportunities with these BRICS countries? Um, these five countries, indeed, are in fact very different. Um, Brazil, South Africa, are commodity rich, and China is very hungry for commodity. Uh, China is very good in the manufacturing. However, uh, India is even better uh, in terms of English-speaking service industry. So I think in this case, the five countries should be able to find out uh, their own comparative advantage and explore those opportunities and uh, find out more opportunity for trade and also for cross-border investment. Now, each of these countries mm. obviously has very different economic fates. They, they're facing their own mm. challenges. So with that being said, what are some of those challenges that China faces economically with some of these BRICS countries? What? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, if you look at the very longer term, um, can't you look at India, um, countries in Africa that are still very young in terms of um, population. But however, China is aging rapidly. Um, many people probably do not know, in the past three years, China lost over one million working age population a year. Okay? That even though the total population is still rising, but if you look at the population between, say, ages 16 to 60, Okay, this is how the working age population, they are declining in absolute term. So China's aging very fast. So uh, there's even, um, even more reason for those two countries, all the five countries, to find out ways to, um, to explore uh, the comparative advantage and to, to um, trade a bit more. And how do you think with that changing, changing dynamic of, of working age Chinese, how do you think that might fit into some of the trade opportunities that BRICS offers? So for example, um, India, uh, South Africa, their population is still very young. That means it still will create large um, quantities of uh, labor for manufacturing and service industries. And at the same time, China's uh, labor costs are rising very rapidly. Uh, we all know China's export, even though China's still an export machine, but China's export declined uh, in absolute term. Um, it's negative 5% and negative 3% in 2015 and 2016. Now, part of it is because of expensive um, RMB exchange rate, but more to it is because um, the domestic cost is rising very rapidly, the cost of land, um, energy, and also especially labor. When you ask a China manufacturer, uh, what's the number one headache on your list, it's always labor. So then given what the data is showing us, what are your expectations for China's economy in the next for the next five months for the rest of the year? Uh, before getting to this question, I'll just uh, follow up a little bit on the uh, question you mentioned previously. So that means uh, China, a lot of uh, labor-intensive industry can migrate from China to other countries. Right now, we're seeing such kind of migration from China to countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, but why not, say, India or South Africa? So there are still uh, such opportunities. Um, regarding the question of uh, your near-term China growth outlook, we think uh, China is fine for 2017. As you mentioned previously, uh, the economy seems uh, remarkably resilient. Um, people uh, expect uh, a quite a severe slowdown, hard landing uh, in the 2016-17 that didn't happen. 
the growth was 6.9 in the first half. We expanded to slow down in the second half of the year because of a faded stimulus of title policy. But overall, we still um, pencil in a 6.8 growth uh, for 2017. If that happens, that the first time uh, the annual growth rate picked up in seven years. And just quickly, what reforms and sectors do you think will be key to making sure that China stays on its growth track? Excellent question. Uh, China used to have a lot of low-hanging fruit. China privatized industry, you get a boom economy. Uh, China joined the WTO um, uh, in the early 2000s, you have export boom. Now, and China has a housing reform, you have a real estate uh, boom. Right. Now, see, those low-hanging fruit are behind us, trying to find a new um, growth uh, dynamics. So everybody try to find out if, um, can upward grade economy to be more uh, innovative and technology driven, but right. that's easy to set to, to be done. Um, then I think in the next uh, year or two, China really need to focus on the reform of the state-owned enterprises. Right. The reason because uh, the state-owned companies are less efficient um, than the private-owned, they consume a lot more resources, such as credit. And we've certainly seen the government make strides in that regard. Thank you so much, Jean Ma, Chief China Economist at the Institute of International Finance.